if you could take your seats, we'll try to get this started. Um, we're slightly delayed for those that are online. We'll put the blame in the hands of the air traffic controllers who delayed some of us getting here yesterday. It probably still carries true. So, uh, on behalf of the Alde party and my uh, co-president, Ilhan, uh, I want to welcome you uh, here to The Hague for what is the final Hans van Balen town hall meeting. Um, and at the start, I want to recognize the presence of Inke uh, van Balen, wife of the late Hans, and maybe we'd have a round of applause for your presence, please. <clears throat> Inke, on behalf of everybody here, I, I just want to say to you um, what a great pleasure it was uh, for all of us uh, to know Hans. He was somebody who lived and breathed uh, democracy, politics, um, and the politics of the Alde family every waking hour of his life. I'm sure you saw that probably much uh, to your annoyance on occasion, uh, but he was a true friend to all of us. I had the pleasure of working with him for six years on the Alde Bureau, and I can, I can say without fear of contradiction that his mind was focused not just on domestic politics or European politics, but international politics. And that was the case not just as president uh, of Alde, but his time in Liberal International. Um, he was a powerhouse uh, in the democratic institutions and the democratic politics uh, of the European project. And I know if he was with us today, he would be just as exercised about what's happening uh, in Ukraine and how he might play a role, not for himself, uh, but how he might play a role in bringing uh, all sides together uh, in the best interests of democratic politics and really at the base of that, making life better uh, for the citizens uh, of Europe. So uh, we'll have an opportunity again in Dublin to really mark uh, his contribution uh, to politics across Europe, but particularly um, to the Alde family. So I'm really pleased that you're with us this morning, but more particularly, that yourself and Robert will be with us in Dublin, and we really look forward uh, to reflecting on and celebrating his political life uh, at, that, at that time. So thanks again for, uh, for giving us uh, hands for so many years uh, and sharing him with us. So thanks again. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank those of you uh, who have traveled a long distance and those of you who are still with us uh, online. As you know, we've held a series of town hall meetings on the Conference on the Future of Europe, named after the late, the late hands. Uh, and clearly, uh, that was important to us, uh, that, that, that our work in furthering uh, the workings of the European Union were named, named after, after hands. We've been to Sarajevo, Madrid, Rome, uh, Prague, and Warsaw. Uh, and we're here with you in The Hague today uh, on the final occasion. And of course, it's wonderful to have our, our lead at uh, the European Parliament, Giver Hofstad, who really has been a powerhouse on behalf of ALDE uh, in driving um, the party and in driving the initiative uh, that is our input into the Conference on the Future of Europe. And he's our keynote speaker here today. And we, as always, look forward to hearing his deliberations and his thoughts and his, uh, his, his offerings uh, to us. Um, I suppose we did these town halls to put European citizens um, at the centre of the debate on the future of the European project. And that's, that's really what it's about. And of course, this is what has been all about from the start for us, was ensuring that the citizen had an input into how they thought uh, the European project should work for them. That's really important because we've come through, and I know this at first hand from an Irish perspective, we've come through Brexit. Uh, we're a small country uh, on the western shores um, of Europe our nearest neighbor being Britain, so dependent in, in that, from an economic point of view, on in that interrelationship, and yet they've left the union. We still remain committed because our citizens have always seen the benefits of the European project. That's not to suggest that we don't have issues, and they're the same issues that reside in every country. And I think that's what ALDE can do, is bring together um, those, those issues that we, that, we, that we know are problematic, and we have to try and make Europe work better to resolve those. Uh, so I, I want to take a moment at the start too uh, to thank VVD uh, for hosting this, uh, our last event. Um, you hold a, a special place in the Alde family. 
not just because you were one of the founding parties uh, of Alde, but because of the way in which you have interacted with your citizens, we, we all can, can learn from you. You've been in power now for um, over 12 years. Uh, and from my reading of the polls, there's nothing to suggest that you won't be around for, for, for a, a good while longer. So uh, all of us uh, have, have, can, can reflect on how you interact with your citizens, how you put them to the fore all the time and how you work for them. And I think that really is um, part of your, your, your success. Um, but above all, I want to thank you uh, who are here today and for those of, of, of you who are joining us online. Your presence here is vital in rebuilding and reshaping uh, the European project. Uh, we Liberals, for sure, we deeply believe in the cooperation and open exchange of ideas. And the Conference on the Future of Europe gives us an opportunity to do that. It is who we are as Liberals and it is what the Aldi party has always been about, putting the citizen first. Now, the Conference on the Future of Europe, I think, is a once-in-a-generation chance uh, to shape the Europe that we want to live in. The challenges, as I said, that the Netherlands face in shaping uh, that future are the same challenges that we have right across. And that's, whether that's, you know, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine and the implications that that has for each of our economies, whether it's tackling the inflation that's partly related uh, to the, 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 the uh, invasion, or whether it's assisting our economies recover from the COVID pandemic. These are all challenges that every citizen's face. You see, we can often, uh, within the bubble, that's Brussels or Dublin or London or Paris or wherever, get caught up in the mechanics, the, the, the mechanics, the legal texts, uh, the treaties, um, who's doing what, where, whereas the citizens really only are interested in how that you know, impacts on their daily lives. And the issues that I've identified are more stark now than ever. And that's why we've got to find a, a way through. But, but make no mistake about it. The world's a very different place and Europe is certainly a different place uh, since February 24th. We, we have to respond uh, to, to, to Putin's horrific war crimes by maintaining our resolve to ensure that we bring Europe together to respond. It's been quite some time since we've had an issue that we can gather around on. And I think this is certainly it. The war crimes uh, that have been committed, we've got to respond to that. And, you know, there can be no taboos. Nothing can be off the table in this. The war means, in my view, that we have to look at a European defence union. That does require some countries moving beyond where they would have been uh, in the past. It's something we should be discussing. This is why I think the debate uh, on the EU's role as a global leader is as important now as it has ever been. Whilst at the same time, Putin's war of, of, of aggression uh, has reminded us that energy independence can no longer be a talking point. We cannot only rely on our ability to import oil and gas from those other nations that do not threaten our energy security. I think we must also double down on our efforts to put renewable energies uh, to the fore. Technology is the only way we can rely on ourselves for our energy needs by making us consume less and consume better, by making us do more for less. I don't think we have harnessed the true potential of floating offshore wind to the extent that we can. And I think the Congress in Dublin, based on what we have, uh, the programme we have set out, will very much challenge all of us to have that debate and look to the future in terms of energy independence and climate change, but looking at it through a, a different prism to, to the way in which we have looked at it in the past. You know, from a, from a green perspective, climate change, decarbonisation, is all about what you can't do, what you've to stop doing. Now, I don't know whether it's the bold child in me, uh, and I think it's there in, in, in most citizens. We don't like being told what we can't do. We've got to look at this whole climate change and decarbonisation through a different lens. We've got to look at it through the opportunities, the economic opportunities, and how we can create green jobs and how we can recreate or uh, refashion our economies in a much different way. We also desperately need to have a fully functioning digital single market. And I know that's to the minds and to the fore uh, of many of, of you, particularly those who work uh, in Brussels. We're missing out on about 415 billion euros every year. We do not lack the brains, that's for sure. 
you take Skype, Spotify, Transferwise, Stripe, a company that I would know well, who was set up by two kids uh, in a university close by. It's one of the biggest payment processing companies in the world right now. But why is that in Silicon Valley? Why are the other companies that develop through the brains of European citizens, why do they, why do they always feel they've got to go somewhere else other than Europe? Well, those are the issues that we need to be looking at. We cannot be a superpower, in my view, without a thriving technology sector. But digital isn't all about money, even though money for sure is important. We must defend ourselves for those who seek to harm us by attacking our digital infrastructure. And for this, I think we can learn a lot from our liberal friends in Estonia. And I want to pay particular uh, credit to Kaya Kallas for the work that she has been doing and her, and, and her government have been doing in this regard. Our European democracies are more broadly uh, on a more broadly uh, looked at base, we have more work to do to talk more about Europe and to make sure that the work that happens in Brussels just doesn't remain within that bubble. Increased activity that benefits citizens, breaks down the rhetorical walls, increases partnership with national parliaments. And that's really, really important. We cannot waste this historic opportunity. I very much look forward to discussing the ideas proposed by citizens through the action plan as well as those proposed by people in this room. And I'll conclude on this, ladies and gentlemen, our prosperity, our well-being, our freedoms are not guaranteed. It's up to us and to those of us who come after us to defend it. And I'll conclude on a quotation from the late John F. Kennedy when he said, and I quote, if freedom is to survive and prosper, it will require the sacrifice, the effort, and the thoughtful attention of every citizen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll hand you over now to Malik. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Timothy, uh, for your words, your introduction uh, for today. Um, I'm also asked to give you a brief introduction and welcome word. And of course, dear all, on behalf of the VVD, I would like to welcome you all here uh, to the Hans van Balen Town Hall meeting today in The Hague, his city of Hans, and of course also the city of international peace. Especially welcome, of course, also to Ineke. Great to see you here uh, today. We met each other also uh, first day evening, and it's great to hear also that you and Robert uh, will be there in Dublin uh, in our Congress. Uh, it's very good uh, to be and also to keep that engagement uh, because Hans is still here uh, and also in your presence, Ineke. Um, and I would like, of course, also to welcome all those who are now online, who are watching us uh, from uh, behind the screens today, and witnessing the Russian aggression in Ukraine from the city of international peace is, of course, an enormous contrast and a clear reminder for us that peace is not a default setting, but something that every generation needs to secure, defend, and renew. And we are here today because we as liberals believe that through the contest of ideas, not the contest of arms, but the contest of ideas, we can build a better and a brighter future. Today is the seventh final meeting of the Hans van Balen Town Hall meeting as part of the other contribution to gathering citizens input for the Conference of the Future of Europe. And I'm also pleased that Guy Verhofstadt is here because he is the leading person, the leading man, if we talk about the Conference of the Future of Europe. And of course, today we are also discussing the ideas proposed throughout the ALDA action plan. And I would like also to compliment all the fellow Europeans who have been involved in this project. We will discuss these ideas in two panel discussions. The first one will focus on the EU on the global stage. And the second one is all about EU democracy and the outcomes of the conference. And if I look at these topics, I see at least one common theme. Liberal democracy faces challenges, both from without and from within the European Union. In a very direct way, if we look at the Russian war against Ukraine, it's a fight from illiberalism, 
towards liberalism. But also in an indirect way, such as the gradual dismantling of liberal democracies in certain parts in our own European Union. And of course, I look also to Katka, when I see and mention Hungary, of course, with Orban. We have also a fellow in Poland. It's also clear. Well, we have also exciting elections this Sunday, not only in France, but also in Slovenia, with Jansha, for example. Well, and I mentioned already France. If you look to the polls, well, let's hope that it will be the outcome, but nothing is sure when the boxes are closed on Sunday in Paris. And I see only one answer to this challenge. If we want to defend liberal democracy anywhere, we need to support liberal democracy everywhere. And that means also now these days in Ukraine. One of the strongest defenders of this view was, of course, our dearly beloved friend and colleague, Hans van Baalen. Hans understood the importance of freedom and through his enormous dedication and fight for individual rights, he defended the values and beliefs on which we continue to build on today. And for that, liberal democracy is not a nice to have, no. It's a must to have, a need to have, because liberal democracy empowers individuals. And we as liberals believe that people should have the freedom and the right to live their lives according to, our, to their own views, their own needs, and their own dreams. Why? Well, because this is what makes ordinary people capable of doing extraordinary things. Not just for ourselves, but also for the people around us. Our families, our friends, our neighbors. This is why liberal democracy is so important. This is why we as liberals have to take to stand and defend and develop our liberal democracy. And this is why today the Hans van Baalen Town Hall meeting is so important, so that we can engage in this important work. Rest me to wish you a very good Hans van Baalen Town Hall meeting today here in The Hague. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I thought the scenario is different than uh, uh, Guy is uh, supposed to speak now to give uh, uh, introductory remarks and Katrin as well. So I would like to invite one of you, Katka, uh, to give a bit of overview of what was uh, so far uh, in, the, in, the, in the EP discussion, uh, what is the way forward when it comes to the Conference on the Future of Europe, and then uh, Guy will give uh, his input. And uh, I think in, in a couple of minutes we will have the the slides on the screen. Please, Katka. Thank you very much, Johan. And uh, first of all, let me also thank the DVD for hosting this event, and particularly thanks to uh, the family of Hans van Balen, uh, who I have the honor to meet. Um, It's very, always a very interesting feeling to talk about the conference uh, on the future of Europe for me. Um, the question that first comes in mind is not that the real challenge ahead of us is what kind of future Europe will have. I, I, I think the real question here is if Europe has a future. Because the conference on the future of Europe is not only going on uh, in Strasbourg, uh, not only going on in the uh, European Parliament and in groups and halls like this, but as we speak, the conference on the future of Europe is actually happening real, real time on the big screen in France and in Slovenia. Uh, this is the big question that uh, people are being faced with. What kind of Europe we want? Do we want 
a strong Europe, a powerful one, that is able to take on the challenges of the future, that has a strong voice on the global scene, that is more than just an area of uh, trading and uh, nice civil relations? Or do we have a weak Europe? Do we have a Europe where uh, outside influence infiltrates, where decisions take years, and where uh, citizens just sighing uh, under the weight of powerlessness. Do we have a Europe of uh, Macron or do we have a Europe of Le Pen? Uh, do we have a Europe of uh, Jenza or do we have a Europe of Alena Bratyshek? These are the questions. And they are questions that go deeper than I think either of us would imagine. Because I'm quite sure that there are some of you in this room who would say that like, I don't really want either. I like Europe as it is. I don't want to take two big steps. Why would I do that? Uh, my country is safe. Uh, my life is comfortable. These decisions are hard. They might cost money. They might cost me influence. They might uh, bring about uncertainty, and I don't like it. But I honestly have to tell you, colleagues, that this might not even be a real dilemma. I'm from a country, I'm from Hungary, and I see what the alternative of a powerful Europe is. I, uh, I know that democracy can be fragile if we do not dare to take the big steps, the strong ones. I know, and so many of my countrymen know, how it feels like uh, to lose everything in a couple of months just because uh, of the slowness, just because of uh, the discrepancies between what we say and what we do. Um, I, I would like to inspire you, uh, colleagues, to be brave and uh, wherever you have a voice in your national parliament, in your communities, uh, in your parties, to advocate for powerful and brave solutions. Not only uh, because that's the politically right one, but because I think this is what the citizens want. There are the big questions out there. The questions about the war, about climate change, about democracy, about the future of Europe, about our prosperity, about our independence. And I don't think they want small steps. They want solutions. And solutions are always a bit painful, but can be very rewarding at the end. And I'm telling you, you that during the Conference of the Future of Europe, where I took uh, part uh, in discussing the values of uh, the Europe, uh, European future, Many things that uh, I perceive to be maybe a bit too intellectual before or an exercise within the bubble, so to say, is actually something that interests a lot of people. Uh, and, and people want solutions for the questions of the rule of law, uh, for the questions of the media, the questions of uh, independence or, or of data protection. And the solutions that the citizens proposed were big and brave. And uh, I believe that our responsibility as politicians to, to listen to them and uh, to provide the brave solutions that Europe indeed needs and our citizens indeed crave. And this is why I'm so honored to be in the same uh, group uh, with Guy Verhofstadt. And I'm a, a little bit, uh, it's, it's a little bit challenging to speak before him, uh, but I'm so glad that Guy realized the importance of, of this conference, realized the importance of listening to the people, of taking big steps in the future, of reforming the EU, to making us stronger, making us more powerful, making us really a player on the global stage. Uh, he did it, he did a conference on the future of Europe even before it started for years, right? Uh, and and uh, I, I'm great, so grateful to uh, be a part of this drive where we are actually now pushing this uh, tremendous and historic exercise, hopefully, uh, further and hopefully to real change. Because the opposite of change is that Europe has no future, in my opinion. The Europe as we see now, this, sorry, but slow, weak, apolitical, powerless Europe has no future. We are not living in a peaceful and nice world. We don't have rainbows and bunnies all around us. Uh, it's not a peaceful time. It is a time where uh, Interests collide. There's a time where big decisions are made, where fights are fought. And if Europe is not present in this fight because they are still 
contemplating on who is the person they should send and how long uh, does a process should take and how much everybody should be in unison in order to even issue a press release, then Europe will not have a future. So I hope that we will be able to come together in 10 years uh, with the liberal family and reminiscence about the steps we took when Europe was at a turning point when we were standing at the crossroads, and how we managed to use our political tools, our vision, our power, our citizens, to turn Europe into a community with a real future. Because Europe deserves a future, and the world deserves a Europe with a future. Because without us, well, look at Hungary. I don't think we want that for the globe, right? So let's get to work, and let's realize the Europe our citizens crave us to be, Europe that can act. Liberals are all about action. We are all about solutions. So let's so, uh, show it to the world. No more excuses, just more action. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katka, for your, for, for your words and for your encouragement. Uh, certainly, liberals are for action and we want to act, we want to change things for better. And uh, you described uh, relatively well what are the challenges, but also what are the opportunities ahead of us. So without further ado, uh, Guy, I would like to give you the floor for a keynote speech, and then you will sit in my panel, we'll have an in-depth discussion about the, the current challenges yep. and where we want to see Europe in the future. Please. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, thank you, Ion. And uh, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here on this uh, uh, Hans van Baalen Town Hall meeting. I did another one in Rome. Yes. Uh, together, by the way, with, uh, with our friends uh, from Ukraine. So that was before the war. Uh, I think it was a minister of Europe, European integration. Uh, the prime worked, minister, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, who was uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with us. And um, I, I'm coming back from Kiev, and I, I told naturally about Hans, because uh, when you go to the uh, city hall uh, from uh, the presidential palace, you go through uh, Maidan. And uh, so I remember me very well the, 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 the period where uh, on Maidan there were these huge protests. We were there, with Hans was there, and uh, we did there a, a, a speech which is, was criticized for years, but since a few weeks I don't receive any criticism anymore. <laughs> really? Uh, you, you remember that? Uh, what Van Balen and Verhofstadt were doing there? Uh, they started, we were even responsible for the start of the war eh? uh, in some of the, uh, the reactions of the social media. But I have to tell you that I should say, unfortunately, since a, a, a few weeks, uh, these critics uh, vanished. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, it's, it's absolutely clear why. We, because we have seen an, uh, the most brutal aggression uh, since the Second World War by, uh, by a country. Uh, going into an, a democratic, independent country, uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, who has made the choice for what? For Europe, for European values. And the real reason, in my opinion, why uh, Putin is starting this war and is doing this war has nothing to do with security issues, has nothing to do even, I think, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the big dream of, uh, of a Russian empire. That's because he's, fear, he's fearing that uh, with Belarus, what's happening in Belarus, with uh, the choice that Ukraine has made for European and democratic values that could spread to Russia itself and uh, to the Russian society, uh, that could create, uh, would be the beginning of the end of an autocratic regime. I think that that is the real reason why uh, for this war. It's a fight uh, between liberal democracy at the one hand and autocraticism and autocracy at the other hand. And that's also the new world order in which we live and in which we have to think about the future of Europe. This is not longer the world of uh, uh, 45, uh, 89, uh, the Cold War. This is not longer the world of uh, 89, uh, 2022. Liberal democracy has won. Uh, Fukuyama, you remember that? The end of history. Uh, everything is uh, done. Uh, we, 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 uh, we live in the best uh, 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 of all worlds. Now notice, I think, a, a new world has emerged uh, on the 24th of February. And that will be a world of, of empires. There will be empires of the good and empires of the bad. Uh, and if we want to survive in this world, 
survive as, as, as a European Union, we need to uh, uh, reform our European Union the fastest as possible and to take lessons from what is happening in, in, in the world today. It's a world of empires, not a world of nations. Because uh, look to, uh, to China, China is not a, is not a nation, it's, it's a civilization, it's Han. And inside uh, Han, the Han civilization, there are many, many, many ethnies and many, many uh, nations. Now, India, for example, is, is, not, uh, is not a nation too. There are 2,000 nations and 2,000 ethnies in India. At the same time, they use uh, more or less uh, 20 languages in India, and there are four big religions, and it's the biggest democracy at the same time. That is a powerhouse, that is a, a, an empire. The United States of America, they are an empire, no? Uh, they tell it themselves, so we, we don't need to describe it. Uh, it's an empire, an empire for the good, uh, but it can also change. Look what happened uh, the last years. Can you imagine that we are in the same situation as today with Trump as President of the United States? And that Putin is taking this decision. Probably no intervention of the Americans, no delivery of weapons. I don't know, but I think that will be, the outcome will be that we will be totally alone, totally alone, Europe, in facing that threat from, uh, from Russia. That is a possibility. So if we look to the future of Europe, we have to think in that sense. The world has changed, is a world of empires, not longer uh, nation states alone. Nation states play a crucial role naturally, but it are the alliances that are crucial. A country today independently, a nation independently, has not a security if it, not, it, it is not making part of a bigger entity. Can be NATO can be the European Union, but it has to have a security, a base for stability. So we have to think about the future in Europe in, in, in that sense. What if tomorrow the same thing is happening and we can, for example, not rely on our American friends because there is a Trumpian president? That is the question that we... So th that doesn't mean that we have to say, no, we don't want NATO anymore, or we need European defense instead. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with our capacity or capability or sovereignty or autonomy to make all decisions inside a North Atlantic Treaty Organization at the same time inside the European Union if, for example, we have some interest to defend or, or security to defend. And that's the case today. So the whole issue about uh, the future of the European Union is about that. What is our autonomy, our sovereignty, our decision-making power on digital, on military, financially, politically, in a world of empires? That's the question. And I think we organized this uh, conference of the future of Europe. Uh, I should say at the right, the, the timing was okay, <laughs> that you could say. We, 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 because yeah, we are talking inside this conference about uh, uh, yeah, answers to challenges as we are facing today uh, in and around uh, Ukraine. That's the issue. So we are talking inside this conference about, yeah, don't, uh, do we need uh, a European Defense Union as a part, as a pillar of, uh, the, uh, of the NATO North Atlantic Treaty Organization? And the answer of the citizens, because we organized the whole thing, you know that, I will not repeat that, uh, uh, citizens' panels, uh, national on national level, on the European level, the answer is people say, yeah, maybe you need to build up uh, some joint armed forces uh, uh, of uh, the European Union. And obviously that is absolutely necessary, actually, because if you look to uh, defense and military expenditures on the world scale, and certainly in Europe, that's the biggest waste of money of Europe is defense. Huh? You are aware of that. I have maybe, are there slides? Is my, I, I have sent it something about that to, to yeah, I push, but I don't do anything. Uh, that, is, uh, that is another thing. So that I come back to this later on. That is about digital. That's another disaster in Europe. Uh, and, uh, but, but this is the expenditures of, uh, sorry. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. I'm gonna move there. Yeah, but you can see it also, Ilya. But so that are the expenditures. So unfortunately, I have the wrong slide with me because normally I put uh, the whole uh, expenditures of uh, the European Union and military in one, in one balloon. 
Here you have different balloons, Germany, France, UK, Italy, so it's still from the pre-Brexit period. So we have still uh, the UK uh, inside the European, but because they, they will come back, so uh, we, we, uh, they will come back. We don't know what moment, but they will come back. So if you make the total balloon of Europe, you will have a balloon that is as big as China, 250 billion. If you put the UK in it, you have even 300 billion. And then you have Russia, 61. Now, there's something that doesn't look right here, no? Uh, there is a country with 61 billion, uh, autocratic regime, uh, making difficulties, and we can, in fact, not defend ourselves because we need the US, that's now more, and that's more than 700 billion uh, dollar. So we are the second biggest spencer, uh, spender of military worldwide, after the Americans, even with the UK out. And we do exactly the same as the Chinese, and we do four times more as the Russians. But we are not capable to stop them. No, 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 we need to do not. Fortunately, we have it. And why it is? Because there is duplication, duplication, duplication. Like uh, uh, we always say, we have the capacity only to do 10% of the operations of the American army. So we are spending more or less 30 or 40% of the American expenditures on military, what is enormous. People say it's not enough, we need 2%. I say you can increase the 2% everywhere. If you don't create a European defense community, it will change nothing at all because you will simply amplify the duplication in Europe. That's what you are doing. So what is needed is uh, really a defense union inside, the, inside uh, the NATO organization as the European pillar of this. And we, because today, like I said, we spend 30, 40% of the American army, we can only do 10% of the operations of the American army. So I'm a lawyer, I have nothing to do normally with mathematics. <laughs> I'm always saying, nevertheless, I was Minister of Budget in my life, but okay, th that's not necessary to know anything about mathematics, uh, Minister of Budget. Uh, only the word no is uh, needed uh, to be a Minister of Budget. <laughs>